Hey, Connection Point Church, welcome to those of y'all in the room. All right, to those of y'all at the uh, Williams and Rowlett or uh, wherever you're watching this uh, at home, on your couch, on your patio, wherever you are, I'm excited because we are closing out this series called out, and today is going to be the one that some of y'all have been waiting on. We are talking about us versus them. We are talking about the division in this world, and I will be honest, as I've been looking at this, where I thought this message would go five weeks ago, and even as I started thinking, through it, it went a total different direction. I was so convicted. Wow, see, the Lord just joined us. Man. All right. It, I was so convicted uh, of this that I want to remind us before we get in it, I want to say a couple of things. First of all, uh, as I'm preaching today, if it gets heavy and I you know, feel like I'm, I'm in your, your email and, and the, you're like, why is he preaching just to me? Why is he preaching at me today? If it feels like I'm yelling at you, know that I preached this to myself so much this week that this has challenged and convicted me probably as much as I've been challenged and convicted that I have a very heavy heart preaching this. Um, And I also want to remind us where we started. On Easter Sunday, we talked about Lazarus, how Lazarus was called out of the grave, but he was called out of the grave to where he, he lived and everywhere he went, people saw, oh man, that's Lazarus. That's proof that Jesus is who Jesus said he was. But eventually Lazarus died again, and he lived his life under the threat of death because of who he was, because he was called out of the grave. So in Christ, we are called out into this mission, but we are also called out to eternal life, that Lazarus was was raised to the dead as a picture of what Jesus does for us. And so if you feel convicted in this message, if you feel like, man, why is he why is he going this? I, I'd much rather us versus them. Let's focus on the them, and, and, uh, and we're going to focus on the us a little bit today. Um, so as we're going through this, remember, first of all, that, that idea that First and foremost, we are called out because we were called from death to life, and you have eternal life in Christ. We have hope. The power of Jesus Christ will, will raise you to life forever. So if you're convicted, if you, I don't want you to lose sight of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. There is forgiveness in all of our failings. Now, as I've gone through this series, uh, we, we basically focused on three challenges that we see in this world and how the gospel speaks to it. Because I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the solution to all our problems. And so we've looked at three specific problems. The first one, we, uh, we, some of the things we've talked about in this, in this uh, series, um, last week we talked about emotions. Don't follow your emotions. Uh, the week before that we talked about that you need to be willing to suffer. We talked about the fact that we live in a culture that is avoiding hard things, avoiding suffering. We want comfort. We want to to live our our awesome lives, whereas as Christians, we are called to suffering. And then last week, we talked about following our feelings. And and, and we always, we think our emotions are true. We think our heart is true, but our heart is deceitful. Um, Last uh, Tuesday, I was having breakfast with John Williams, one of our elders, and uh, I said the statement, you know, I feel the Bible is telling us this. And he stopped me and he said, listen, you, you don't feel that the Bible is telling us. And, and he brought me back to my message last week and he called me out on it. And he said, listen, we, we've got to speak truth that it is not our feelings. This is what the Bible says. So this is what we're going to do. And I was challenged even in that message. So today, I hope you are challenged in a new way in this message um, because it challenged me. And just know I was challenged before you were challenged. I was challenged in this. And I see areas of my life that need to be corrected. When we talk about divisions and us versus them, it's kind of a question of how did we even get here where we are so divided to where if you wore a mask in here or not, that might be a a statement on whether or not you are a good person or not. Somehow that, that might be a division of whether I talk to you for the rest of the week or not. And it's just insane. You know, when I was uh, in college, I, I loved to play basketball one year, one week, uh, actually one evening. I was playing basketball, uh, and I was outside, and it was just me, and it wasn't my usual crew. Uh, it was just me and a friend, maybe a couple. My brother might have been there. I don't know. Uh, he can tell you if this story is true then, but it's true. Uh, my friend w- was getting real competitive, and I'm competitive at the time. I was really competitive, and the, the, a guy on the other team started jawing and, and talking noise and talking trash to my friend, and he started saying some racial slurs to my friend, and it got really heated, okay? So uh, my friend, he started jawing back, and let's just say within moments, 
Words had been said on both sides that were so explosive that every single court shut down and they were all about to kill. And I think that's not too much of an overstatement. They were mad and they were ready to attack uh, my friend, one of my roommates. And it was one of those things where I'm sitting there and I, I, I'm, I'm playing, I, I'm waiting on the next game. Actually, I wasn't in this game. I was just watching, but I was hearing it. And uh, we had probably won all our games and they told us to sit out. I probably didn't lose. That's probably why I was sitting out. But I just remember sitting there and all of a sudden, every court had shut down and was ready to fight my friend. And nobody was right. They both were way over the line. And so uh, as the story goes in my memory, we did the only thing that me and, and a couple of our, our, our friends did the only thing to try to uh, diffuse the situation, uh, we jumped my friend and just started hitting him and, and pushing him and picked him up and we took him out as if we were going to you know, maul him. And then as soon as we got to the gate, we left and we said, golly, we got to get out of there. And I just remember thinking, how did this happen? Like I was literally sitting there playing basketball or, and just, or, or watching basketball, just having a good time. I had the all day been thinking, I can't wait to get out and play some basketball. And before I know it, it was us versus them. And the thing is, is I didn't even choose sides. I was given a side. All of a sudden, I was, was part of the us and there was a them. And I never even chose which side I was going to be on. It just kind of happened. When I look at the situation we find ourselves in, we are so divided, and some of us, we're, we're excited. We're like, hey, it's us versus them, and we're right, and they're wrong. And, and then there's me. In a lot of ways, I feel like I don't even know how it got here so quickly, how all of a sudden, some of the things that I used to believe, and they were just kind of my beliefs, all of a sudden, that's defining me of whether or not I'm a good person for the rest of my life, whether or not we're right or wrong, simply in some uh, weird beliefs, and some of them aren't even political. They're just small belief. How did we get here? I want to go about this two different ways today because in the past year since this division has been ramping up and ramping up, I've said this over and over again. I believe the church is the solution. I believe ideally what needs to happen is for people who are divided and seeking answers and all that to be able to look inside the church and say, oh, there's a place that looks like heaven. There's a place where all of this craziness is not happening. It's in the church, and they're drawn to it, not because we're smarter or we're doing it. It's because we're living this, this truth in Christ that is so much more compelling than the divisions we see. That's the vision. But even over the past year, I find myself struggling. So before we even talk about the us versus them outside the church, we need to talk about the us versus them inside the church. And I want to just read some scriptures. We're going to break it down a little bit, but the, the, the scriptures enough are challenging to you. And I'm going to read you the words of Jesus. And for some of us, if you haven't been in the Word a lot, you're going to be shocked at Jesus's words. You're going to be shocked I chose this for unity. Because I thought about going to John 17 where he says we should all be one. We should, I mean, Jesus prayed a prayer for you, and his prayer is that we will be one. We will be united. But understand, before he said that to his 12 disciples alone, and they were, they were already united, he had been telling them this with a whole crowd of people. And he said this message enough to where the crowds left, and there's just 12, actually 11, because even one of them didn't make it. And so understand the message that he was telling to the crowds and to people who thought they were religious, who thought they were following God, the message he gave to them was really one that was going to start the message of unity. This is Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. Do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against father and daughter against her mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of their own household. Now, some of you would say that's my life anyway, but it's for the wrong reasons, right? But the truth is, is there's, there's this call that Jesus says is, hey, listen, if you thought this was going to be something about unity in your family, if, you, if, some, if you're a Christian, just life works out for you. He says, listen, you are in for a hard, hard time because if you are a Christian, there's going to be division in your own household. Your enemies are going to be in your own household speaking against you, going after you. And he keeps going. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. 
Whoever loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, I would love to tell you, okay, here's Preacher Joel. Let me tell you what that really means. The problem is, is Jesus speaks for himself. What that means is he looked at people, at mothers and fathers. He looked at sons and daughters, and he says, if you do not love them more than me, if you are not willing to walk away from them in order to follow me, you are not worthy of me. That is the message Jesus gave to his church. And if you wonder why there were only 11, really, that we hear about, read what he said, and you can see. Because I've had plenty of well-meaning Christians, and I've probably thought this, just never actually said it out loud. I've had many mothers come up to me and say, you know what, I would never forsake my child for, for Jesus. I'm, I'm too good of a mother, thinking that that's a good thing for a Christian to say, but understand that's where Jesus would look at you and say, okay, you're not even worthy to follow me. Man, you read just the weight of his words. Then he says this, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He's predicting he's going to actually go to his death. He's going to have to carry the cross beam of his cross, and he's going to go to his death. Whoever is not willing to give their life for me, Jesus says, is not worthy to follow me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. We, we all want to find life in Christ. But none of us like the method that Jesus says, the way you find life in Christ is you give up your own life. You live your life, even if it's not death yet, you live your life saying, hey, this is what I want. But nevertheless, I'm laying that down. I'm dying to that and I'm following Christ. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, there's a message of unity here, but we need to be clear. The unity in Christ is that there are some people that are on a mission to follow Jesus. Their entire life is going to be reoriented. Simon Peter is going to leave his wife in some way. I mean, he didn't divorce her, but he had to tell her, hey, I'm married. I love you. I'll come visit as much as I can, but I'm going to follow Jesus. And we need to understand that the, the followers that actually walked and followed him were people who, did th who, who, who took this mission so serious that many of us would not even recognize that we are following Christ when we look at how they followed Christ. The calling is a mission. And so I want to talk about two things of division in the church that I see, even in Connection Point Church. The first thing is consuming. Consumerism in the church. If you are a consumer of church, you are not on a mission for God. You know, when he says that, whoever does not take up my cross, it's the reason they were so united, the reason that they were, they were that the mission of God grew so, so fast, and, and even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of, of strife, is because people saw actual legit people who would do anything to win the war, who would do, it, who would do anything to follow Jesus. But, you know, some of us are just so focused on what the church can give us. Can we, can we be ministered to? Can we do the, you know, what am I going to get out of it? It's not, it's kind of inconvenient right now. And we have this mindset of consuming and, and we're not on the mission we were called to. We are just here so that people can do for us. But when it comes for us, hey, I, we need you to serve. We need, to, we need you to go and, and be here and show up. And, and hey, there are hurting people in your connect group. Well, I, I haven't been to connect group in, in three weeks. Or, you know, I didn't even sign up because it's online. We have all of these excuses. But, but we forget we're on a mission. And, and we don't even realize we're consuming. I want to give you two excuses that I've heard. And uh, I've heard these more and more and more and more and more as, as COVID has gone on. The first one is, I don't have the capacity, sometimes the mental capacity. I've heard this over and over again. People saying, you know what, I just don't have the capacity. And in some ways, that's okay. Like Teresa Nash, we um, stepped off of our leadership team because she, that's a, a lot of time to, to run our ki kids' ministry. I called her out and I said, Teresa, I think you need to take some time off uh, from this serving here. I don't think you have the capacity, but... Teresa still went yesterday and she served at the Wiley Christian Care Center. I had no fear that, that Teresa was going to take that and say, okay, I don't have to be a Christian now for a while. I know she was so much on mission. If anything, my fear for her was that she was going to serve Jesus without Jesus, and that's a dangerous recipe. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking people who are serving so much and in it so much 
that, you, that they're over capacity. I'm talking about those of us that are, that, that are using this excuse, I don't have the capacity, and, and I'm talking about I can't read my Bible right now. I can't pray. I don't have the capacity right now to pray. I don't have my, the capacity right now to, to text someone in my connect group and check on them and see how they're doing. I don't have the capacity to make a meal for someone or even to know how, how my people are doing. I don't have the capacity to go serve somewhere else. I'm telling you, if that's you, then what I see is someone who has made the decision, you know what, I'm going to put my cross down for a little bit. I'm going to get off mission for a little bit. I'm going to take this. I'm, not, I'm at capacity. I can't follow Christ. And understand, Jesus' response to that is if you're not willing to be a part of this mission, you are not worthy of this mission. This is a high calling, and our capacity has to leave room to follow Jesus. And some of us, I think, have forgotten this. The other thing is, you know what, it's just hard right now. I've heard this excuse. It's just hard right now. How many of you would say it's hard right now? It is hard right now, okay? But listen, I want to be, I want to be clear here. We throw this, this around. It's just hard right now. You know, watching uh, online, it's, just, it's, it's, it's hard to watch online. It's hard to get my kids up and get to a gathering. It's just hard right now. Some of us are confusing ourselves with our language of hard things, when it comes to following Christ, it, it, it's hard being hated for your beliefs. That's hard. It's hard being uh, giving your life for your beliefs. It's hard being tortured for your beliefs. It is inconvenient to watch church on your phone. It is not hard. Let's make sure we get this clear. It is inconvenient to be in a connect group online when you used to be there in person, and it doesn't connect the same way. I hear you, but it is not hard hard when you look at what it means to follow Christ. If we tell ourselves it is hard to watch church on a phone, when the real hard things come, you have to leave your job because they're calling you to do something against your faith. Or you have to go talk to someone who you know is not gonna, gonna receive it well, but God has put them on your heart to go and tell the gospel. Or God forbid he were to tell you to go to a different country or go risk COVID or go risk your own health, go risk your family. You're going to say, man, it's hard to watch it online, and you're, not, there's, you're, not, you're never going to even get to the call of Christ. We have tricked ourselves with our language of it being so hard and we're over capacity, and we have started consuming church as if it's just about what can I get out of it. The truth is, if we're not faithful to the little things, we're never going to be given the hard things. We're never going to be given the truly, truly big things. You know, we were called to suffer. We're called to struggle. Hard things are what we're called to. And some of us are telling ourselves, man, it sure is hard. I have to wear a mask into church right now. It's hard right now. You know, it's not hard. It's inconvenient. And we need to start getting our language right. We need to get our minds wrapped around. Church is not about me. The second thing, if you liked that one. And by the way, this is kind of how I think about this. Some of, as I've prayed about this, and this is me too sometimes. I want, to, I want to let y'all step into the judging me a little bit. I don't want you to feel like I'm judging you. I want you to feel like, I'm, let's say hypothetically, this is not in my real life, but let's say that I came to you and asked for some marital advice. And this is what I said. Hey, I want y'all to just help me out here. Man, I, my marriage is struggling right now. And so my wife, she's, she's kind of, she's sick. I don't know if she's over, I don't know what's going on, but she's just ill. I come home and she's in bed coughing and she's just, she's not, you know, she's struggling a little bit. And, you know, we've got the kids, we've got life going on around, but every time I'm around my wife, she wants me to make her some food or talk to, encourage her a little bit. She wants me to help with a kid. And I'm telling you, it's just the season right now. It's hard. And so I moved out. I got a hotel and I've been eating out and I've been going to Chili's and everything every night. And you know what? I love my wife. And when things are back to normal, when she's feeling better, I'm going back and, and man, I'm in. When, when she's better... And, and it's convenient. I'm going to come back in. I'm going to love my, I love my wife so much. I can't wait to get back. I can't wait. What would you say to me? You would say, I think you. Well, for my wife, okay. I think y'all would say exactly, I think you missed out on what marriage is. This is the exact same time. If you want to know how to love your wife, that's, this is the moment. If you want to know when the world really needs to see what the church looks like, this is the moment. This is when we say, you know what, I've saved some capacity. I've saved some of some, uh, 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 the hard things so that I'm ready to run. And some of us are consuming and we wonder, man, I'm just not seeing God move the way I thought he would move in this hard time. And some of us have quit the mission and we're consuming. 
Second thing is some of us are pretending, and if you are pretending, you are not on a mission. Let me read you this. This is from Paul, and uh, he says this to, to Timothy. This is, uh, I believe, Second Timothy, and he says this to Timothy, a pastor who's going to be navigating some challenges in the church, and I want you to hear this list, and I want you to judge yourself in this list. Again, this is the Spirit, hopefully, is convicting us, not Joel. He says to Timothy, understand this, in the last day there will come times of difficulty. There will be people who are lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable. You can never do it right for them. Slanderous, without self-control. They'll just basically say, I'm going to do whatever I want. Some of us whole years, hey, it's COVID, what am I going to say? I do We've given us without self-control. My favorite line of this is, some people are brutal, just brutal. You ever met somebody? Man, they're just brutal. Not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Here's what I want you to see. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Verse 5, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. He's telling there are going to be people coming into your church, Timothy. They're going to look godly. They're going to act godly, but they're going to deny the power of God. They're not going to be people who pray. They're going to be people who demand. They're not going to be people who are down on their knees serving and doing whatever they can do to make sure that the fellowship and the body is being built up and the kingdom of God is expanding. They're going to have demands and they're going to want it their way when they want. And by the way, everything that is preached is about other people. It's never convicting them to change their life, to have self-control and to follow God. They deny the power of Christ in their own life but they demand it from you. They're pretending. And I see this all over, and I'll tell you, this season may be a wake-up call. Some of us may realize, you know what, I've just been pretending when it comes to following Christ. The reason the church inside doesn't look like something that's drawing people from the outside may be because we've got a lot of people, and the division isn't that we're divided and we don't agree with one another. It's because half of us, or, or, or smaller than that, some of us are on this mission to give our lives and to storm the gates of hell, and we look to our side and our brothers and sisters are all like, oh, y'all are serious about that? Oh, I thought I had soccer practice. We had, man, I had a hard week. I didn't know you're really serious about winning people to the Lord. I didn't know you were serious about us loving each other radically. Man, I thought we were just talking. I just thought that was what we did. For 1,900 years, there was no Sunday school. There was no church institution where you could, uh, if you wanted to disciple your kids, you know what you did? You sat down at the table and you talk to your kids about Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong when I say this. We, I love kids ministry and youth ministry and all those things. And it's always been our view here is that we are partnering with you as parents, that partnering with me as a parent. To, uh, we want to have great teaching. We want to have great guidance. We want people you can go to. But one of the challenges we face right now is that we don't have a place where we can just farm out our kids to be discipled. And, and some of us view that as a bad thing but it might be exactly what we needed. And here's my heart. First of all, I'm scared that there are some of us, the reason we're not sitting down, we call ourselves a Christian family, but are you a Christian family if you never as a family sit down and read the Bible? If you never as a family get together and pray? If you never as a family say, hey, what is the Lord calling us to? Is that a Christian family? Let me just challenge you there. Some of us, I'm afraid, don't take this step. You know what, I don't know how to, to lead my kids because the truth is I've been pretending in my own life. I'm not in the Word. How can I teach my kids the Word? I'm not on my knees praying. How can I, how, I let them see me? And I'm telling you, some of us, the most powerful thing that could happen in your kid's life is not that for a, an hour on Sunday they go to a kid's ministry. The most powerful thing is that they see mom or dad get on their knees with them and struggle through how, how to follow Christ. You read the Bible together, and I'll, I'll tell you, parents, the easiest way to do if you have a kid Get the kid's Bible and use that, and you, that can disciple you as well, and read the kid's story. Have you ever met those people that are Star Wars nerds? There's any Star Wars nerds? And they know, they know like the spaceships that, that fly by for a half second, and they're like, oh, that's the so-and-so, the A-14, and it's from blah, blah, blah planet. And you're like, what? You understand that how that started was they went through it one time and just watched the movie and enjoyed it. And they saw it again, and they saw this ship. And then at some point, the curiosity took them to where they got that journey. Some of us need to understand, hey, it's okay if as a, as a, 
as a parent or as a Christ follower, I'm starting on my first time through and I'm just learning the stories. And all I get, I don't get this deep knowledge yet. All I get is, hey, I'm supposed to love my enemies. That's perfect. If you can love your enemies, you're ahead of me probably. Okay? So, so don't, don't, don't take this, but to understand, I think it could be the most powerful thing that happens in your family is not them, not our Sunday school or, or our, our kids or youth ministry that we're going to have. And when, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome to have those things. But the most powerful thing could be your child seeing dad down on his knees praying before they go to school, praying by name for them out loud, seeing dad with his Bible open, trying to wrestle through, what does this even mean? That could be what, what changes your kid's life way more than anything that they hear in kids' ministry. But we can't pretend our way out of this. You know, in this church, we, we believe that, that Everything is about a relationship. It's a relationship over religion. It's not about things. But understand, there are three relationships that we talk about, and it comes straight from Jesus. Okay? The first relationship you have to have in your life, you have to have a strong relationship with God. You have to, to have a strong relationship with yourself, specifically who God says yourself is. And you have to have a relationship with others. Without those three relationships, you are not going to be growing. Okay? We say, no God Grow yourself and show others. No, grow and show. They rhyme, we're good, that's how it goes, okay? Know God. What that means is you spend time in the Word knowing God. You build that relationship with God. And you have to. And the key word there is ownership. Own, it is up to you to decide, I'm going to grow my relationship with God. I wish I could preach it for you. I wish I could grow it for you, but I can't. That's on you. If you want to grow yourself in the image of God, here's the tricky thing. You can't read your Bible enough to grow yourself. Because the heart is dece deceitful. It's wicked. It, it, it's going to take you in a different direction. And so what you need to hear from this is you've got to have people around you. You've got to be in a group. And you've got to have Christian men and women who can speak into you. And can say, I see that you're trying to follow God, but you're allowing this in your life. And it is destructive. And, and it is not because we hate you. It's because we love you that we're trying to speak into you. But some of us have tuned out of our groups. It's a place that we go and maybe we open the Bible or whatever. But we don't let anyone speak into it. And we certainly don't go and think, man, so-and-so, man, they, they, they might sharpen me today. Understand, you cannot sharpen yourself in the image of God because you cannot see yourself the way you really are. Our hearts lie to us. I think I'm a great preacher. I think I'm better than a lot of people that you guys think are better than me. That's just the way it is. Our hearts trick us. So I need people to say, Joel, I see you going this route and you need to go this route. I need John Williams like he did on, I say, hey, you keep using that word, I feel. And yet you're using it in context of the Bible and, and, and you just preached against that, Joel. You've got to stop. The last one is show others, okay? So we know God, we've got to take ownership. It's up to me. Show, or to, to grow ourselves in the image of God, we got to have people. You've got to be in a connect group or have a group of Christians who can speak into you and sharpen you. And then the, the last one is show others. You have to, the key word with showing others the love of God, here's the key word. It's margin. You have to have margin in your life. You have to have space so that when the Holy Spirit says go, you can't say, you know what, I've got scheduled all the way through uh, next May. I, I don't have time to follow the Holy Spirit. The way that we love people is you keep room in your schedule so that when someone gets sick, oh, you know what, I'll make the meal. I'll take the kids from them and give them a break. I'm there for them because I left margin. I love them enough to know there's going to be a time somebody needs me and I can step in. If you pack your schedule from, from morning till night, what you're saying is, I love me more than I love you, than them, okay? Now, I think I'm going to have to end here on my message, but I'll tell you, uh, maybe we'll do a series on this. I'm going to just read off to you what I think about outside the church. That's just inside the church, that we've got to get right. We can't pretend and we can't consume if we're going to be so convicting or so, so compelling to people that they're drawn to us. But we've also got to understand some things outside. I'm just going to read off my outline to you, okay? The reason that there's division from the church, that the church is divisive outside, is the first thing, we look like everyone else, we fight like everyone else, and we think like everyone else, okay? Those are my points. I'll just hit them real quick. We look like everyone else. This is what Jesus said. Jesus says, they will know you by your love. They will know you by your love, not your political opinion, not what you think about this issue, the best thing some of us could do outside the church 
is quit talking politics with our neighbor and paint his fence. Serve a meal. Go and let us be known by our actions of love and quit talking outside. You can have one or two or some people that you know well and they know your heart and you can talk politics. I'm not telling you don't, just ignore it. But I'm saying quit just throwing it out there and broadcasting all these opinions that are divisive and we will be known by our love. That is what Jesus says. We will be known. Tertullian, who was a, a, a church father, and I'm just going off now, yeah, who was a church father, he said, man, the unbelievers, they, it was harder then to follow Christ than it is now. They were being killed for their faith. And he says, man, they can't deny us. You know why? Because they see our love for one another. That's how the church exploded, is not by our political opinions, not by whether you not uh, you think we should open up more business. It's because we were loving our neighbors so radically that we had time for them when no one else had time. We cared when no one else cared. We would go into the pandemics rather than flee from them. We would go into the danger because we loved people so much. The, the next one, we fight like everyone else. We yell, argue, and we look just like everyone else. You, you use the same tools, the tools God gave us. Forgiveness. You know what? Biden does something you don't like. How many of us get on our knees and say, you know what? I need to pray for President Biden. I need to pray that God just... Man, I need to pray that his heart is seeking God. I need to pray for him. No, we use the same weapons everyone else. Our prayer, prayer, forgiveness, patience. You know, patience is one of our weapons. You know what, if you don't like the way things are, part of it is, you know what, God, I'm going to pray and I'm going to wait and I'm going to see what you do and, and the things I can't control. I'm going to just have faith. You're going to do it. Four years, we might get a new president. Six years, we might get a new senate or two years, whatever, okay? These things are under God's control. The last thing is we think like everyone else. And this is what I want you to, the, the main thing I want you to see from this. We see, we think just like everyone else. Everyone outside right now thinks it's us versus them. Everyone thinks it's us versus them. But as Christians, it is not us versus them. In fact, let me give you just one scripture from Paul. This is what he said. He said, this is, this is what's really happening. At the, this is Philippians chapter 2. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow on heaven and earth, under the earth. Every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's one story going on out there, and it's not us versus them. It's us and us. That there is going to be a day when we bow down before God, whether we trusted him or not. All of us are going to the same place. We are going to be forever looking at God and bowing down to God. Now, some of us will be in a different situation than others, but understand we are all under God's authority. When we look around, 2 Peter says this, it says, I'm not delaying my return uh, because uh, I'm slow. I'm giving you time to lead other people to Jesus. That's what he says. 2 Peter 3, 16, somewhere there, 15, somewhere on there. Look it up. Um, all that to say, there's, 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 there's this one thing I want you to see, and it's called the Ingalls Skill of Evangelism. I've talked about this before. Every Christian should understand this. I'm going to put it on the screens. It's, called, it's, the, it's a slide. It's the last one. And if it's not, you need to look up the Ingalls Skill, because here's what the Ingalls Skill is. It's called the Ingalls Skill. Is it on there? I don't know if it's on there. Okay. What it is, is it's a way to look at people and their journey in Christ. And every single person you know is on this at some point. So it has uh, the, a one would be someone who has no awareness of God. They may, they don't, they don't even care. Number two would be uh, they have some awareness, but they're not following, you know what I mean? And, and, and then they have contact with Christians. Somebody tells them about Jesus. Uh, and, and you get to eight and somebody gets down and they pray a prayer and they become a Christian, okay? The thing I love about the Ingalls scale is there's so many things, but one of the things is it shows us we're all on the same mission, Every single one of us is going to a place where we're going to eventually praise God and, 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 and bow down to him. And those are us that, that have already met him and follow him. We have, we have steps to go as well. We have a, a mission to go as well. And the only thing we're trying to do with the people that are not there yet is bring them and make them move from a one to a two, a two to a three. We're all on the same mission. So you have these enemies in your mind, you think like everyone else. Instead of seeing enemies on the Republican side or the Democrat side or whatever side, instead of that, we should see every single enemy as a friend to be one, not an enemy to be hated. If you are a Christian, every single person who disagrees with you or opposes you, if they are far from God, your challenge is for you to bring them a step closer to God. If they love Christ and they just have a different, you want to sharpen them so that they are one step more devoted to Christ and you can sharpen them and help them in their walk. We are not us versus them. Everyone is on the same mission. 
We as Christians have a mission to lead people from where they are. This is our church. Where they, y'all say it with me. Where they are to where God wants them to be. That is where we are. And it doesn't matter where they are. If they've never heard of Christ, we're going to preach Christ. If they are, are serving uh, in the kids area, we're going to encourage them and help them. To maybe they pray a discernment from, from missions. I don't know what it is. But we've got to look and begin to see we cannot think like them. It is not us versus them. It is every one of us on the same journey to know God and to make him known. All right, I'm going to shut it off. Let's pray. Lord, with all of my heart, I pray that the church will become so beautiful, so intriguing to those outside, that they're compelled, that even though the cost is high, even though we don't get to, to live life just about ourselves, we don't get to just do the things that we think would feel good or make us happy all the time, sometimes we are called to this, this mission that can be hard, it can be challenging. We have to forsake a lot of things in order to make you known. But Lord, we know the reward. New life. We know where we're going. We're going to not only bow down before you, there's, we're going to be a time where we're in your presence and there, every single tear is wiped from our eyes. There is nothing that hinders us from being in your presence and every single person is united in you. Lord, my hope for us as Christ followers is that we really investigate where are we consuming? Where are we pretending? Where are we not in on this mission? And if we're not in the mission, maybe we need to step back and say, you know what, that's not what I want to be. Maybe that's the best thing that happens during this time. But for those of us that we know we're called to it, maybe we've just kind of forgotten, we've gotten lax. Well, let us be radical for you. Let us love you and pursue you in such a way that people are drawn by our sincerity, drawn by the purpose we live life with and the joy that we have even in the midst of storms and suffering. Lord, give us a heart of joy that is empowered by your Holy Spirit, not by ourselves, so intriguing and enticing to others that they are compelled to follow you the way we do. And Lord, as we look at them, even if they look different than us, if they act different, if they believe different, we don't think like everyone else. Lord, let us see them as one more person on a mission. And let us help spur them on so that they can love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.